welcome to the official episode one of Peter Presents Iliad. Now, I see that uh, this is live, by the way, so um, I see that some of you in the comments already are picking sides, and we have some uh, interesting decisions with some people preferring to go with uh, the Trojans. Very interesting. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're going to get started, though, because uh, for those of you who are just joining this series, um, there's an episode zero, which has all the build-up to this <laughs> episode, and it's a lot. It's like almost an hour, um, And uh, but hey, this is, a, this is a big book, and we've got, you know, all of Greek mythology to set up, and we didn't even do that in episode zero. But don't worry, more to come. We'll space it out a bit more from here on. So also, if you're uh, just joining us or starting to use these, I know some teachers are... Um, using this for their classes, which is incredible to me, honestly, <laughs> that that's a thing. Um, but this is, uh, just so you know, uh, this show is not meant to be uh, appropriate for children. There's violence, we're talking about a lot of adult themes, and so there you go, that's it. Um, now, uh, before we launch into a star our story, and don't worry, I'm not gonna <laughs> like take a whole lot of time for everything, um, but before we do, uh, since we're actually getting to the book, I want to just talk a bit more about this totally awesome book that we're going to be using, which is, of course, Homer's Iliad, as translated by Stanley Lombardo, one of my personal heroes, all the way back from high school when I got this uh, translation, which was given to me by a friend, um, or one of my dad's friends, actually. And um, this is a, an incredible translation, and I intend to tell you more about why exactly this thing is so awesome besides just it's an awesome book, but what makes it a little different from other translations. And uh, one of the things I will say, though, is that Stanley Lombardo put this together so, like, with the idea that it would be spoken aloud in mind, um, which is one of the many reasons, aside from it's just my favorite one, uh, that's one of the many reasons why this is the one we're using for this series. Now, you shouldn't judge a book by its cover, but a good publisher like Hackett Publishing uh, knows how to set the tone of a book with a really well-chosen cover. So I'm going to show you here. I'm going to get, get in the way of my face. All right, so you can see that this is actually a photograph from World War II, to be specific, June 6th, 1944, D-Day at Normandy. And why on earth is this the cover of something that's about what takes place in ancient Greece? Well, rather than explain all that to you um, right off the bat, I'll just give it as something for you to think about. Uh, but I think it's a very excellently chosen cover for this wonderful book. And I also just want to say uh, thank you again to Stanley Lombardo and Hackett Publishing for giving me personal permission to use this copy because while Iliad is in the public domain, translations are copyrighted. So this is really special that we get to do this. Um, that being said, all the opinions, views, and everything that expressed in this program does not necessarily reflect the opinions, views, policies, or anything really of Hackett Publishing and Stanley Lombardo. So they, um, they're they not like sponsoring this series. I asked and uh, they were kind enough to just let me do it. So thank you to them. Uh, but if I say something that is dumb, uh, don't get confused with those guys. <laughs> so there we go. All right. With that, let's just get into this story. So you'll remember, I'll put up my little frame for us here that Boo, there we are. We got through a lot of these characters, and um, uh, we're going to talk about Agamemnon for a second, real quick, because right before he united the Greeks and went all the way over to, uh, all the way over <laughs> to Troy, getting backwards here, this side's Troy, this side's gr the Greeks and the Chians and Achaeans, and the Greeks are also known as the Danaeans as well, there's a lot of names for them, and, uh, but before Agamemnon took everybody over, he was out hunting, and he accidentally shot a deer that was one of Artemis's sacred deer, which is a big no-no. And so she was hindering the winds for them to cross the sea. And Calchas, the soothsayer, the seer, the guy who you get to talk about, like he's the one who does the readings of the birds. I was like, hey, that's an eagle. That's a really good thing. That means we're going to win. Or, hey, that's... 
That's a different eagle. We're going to lose. That's Calchas, all right? And Calchas told Al, Al, told Agamemnon that in order to cross the sea, he had to sacrifice his oldest daughter, Iphigenia, to Artemis. And there's actually a whole play about this. Uh, long story short, Agamemnon killed her and it's it is actually a long story as to all that his brother Menelaus was putting pressure on him the rest of the army you know they tricked her she didn't know up until like you know that that's what was going on it's really really sad now some people there's stuff to say that at the last second Artemis you know pulled her out and put a deer in her place and then she became the priestess of uh temple to Artemis and stuff but there's some people who think that people added that to make it more palatable and um to uh have more sequels to these plays actually with the same characters so uh you know that kind of oh the, the character was definitely dead we'll bring him back kind of you know but that the story isn't totally about that the reason why I'm bringing it up is because of this first book so um Agamemnon has allegedly sacrificed his daughter and the Greeks have gotten over we're nine years into the war I don't have to go over that again um, but the Greeks have been sacking the various cities around Troy and they've been getting the loot of war and supplies from there and um, part of the way that world worked was that they would round up all the booty from the battle including all of the women and then Agamemnon would come in and pick the the girl he wanted as his slave girl basically and then the rest of the people would come in and pick them out depending on rank and stuff like that and um, he Agamemnon took this girl uh, Chryseis all right, who's got an important father, which we'll find out. And the rest of the army, because Achilles is such a big help to everybody, the rest of the army gave Achilles Briseis, who was, like, the second most beautiful. But it wasn't just about beauty. It was also about, like, status. So it's like, oh, you got the girl who had the most important dad and stuff like that. So it really is this, this status thing. And if you are coming away from war without any medals I guess like any prize any clout then uh, it's not so good a thing now uh, as we go through the story we'll see how um, different types of women are treated differently throughout the story so um, but we'll get into that later but that's about everything we got to do so we're going to start reading this book hurrah finally excellent stuff the reason we're here hope you're all sitting comfortably and um, I hope you have a cup of tea or something along those lines. And um, with that, we'll begin Homer's Iliad, book one. Rage! Sing, goddess Achilles, rage! black and murderous that cost the Greeks incalculable pain, pitched countless souls of heroes into Hades dark, and left their bodies to rot as feasts for dogs and birds, as Zeus's will was done. Begin with the clash between Agamemnon, the Greek warlord, and godlike Achilles. Which of the immortals set these two at each other's throats? Apollo, Zeus's son, and Leto's, offended by the warlord. Agamemnon had dishonored Chryses, Apollo's priest, so the god struck the camp with plague and the soldiers were dying of it. Chryses had come to the Greek beachhead camp, hauling a fortune for his daughter's ransom. Displaying Apollo's sacral ribbons on a golden staff, he made a formal plea to the entire Greek army, but especially the commanders, Atreus's two sons. Sons of Atreus, 
and Greek heroes all. May the gods on Olympus grant you plunder of Priam's city and a safe return home. But give my daughter back and accept this ransom out of respect for Zeus's son, Lord Apollo, who deals death from afar. A murmur rippled through the ranks. Respect the priest and take the ransom. But Agamemnon was not pleased and dismissed Chryses with a rough speech. Don't let me ever catch you, old man, by these ships again, skulking around now or sneaking back later. The god's staff and ribbons won't save you next time. The girl is mine and she'll be an old woman in Argos before I let her go, working the loom in my house and coming to my bed far from her homeland. Now clear out of here before you make me angry. The old man was afraid and did as he was told. He walked in silence along the whispering surf line, and when he had gone some distance, the priest prayed to Lord Apollo, son of silken-haired Leto. Hear me, silver bow, protector of Christ, Lord of Holy Scylla, master of Tenedos, and Smynthian god of plague. If ever I've built a temple that pleased you, or burnt fat thigh bones of bulls and goats. Grant me this prayer. Let the Danaeans pay for my tears with your arrows. Apollo heard his prayer and descended Olympus's crags, pulsing with fury, bows slung over one shoulder, the arrows rattling in their case on his back as the angry god moved like night down the mountain. He settled near the ships and let loose an arrow. Reverberation from his silver bow hung in the air. He picked off the pack animals first, and the lean hounds, but then aimed his needle-tipped arrows at the men, and shot until the f death fires crowded the beach. Nine days the gods' arrows rained death on the camp. On the tenth day, Achilles called an assembly. Hera, the white-armed goddess, planted the thought in him because she cared for the Greeks, and it pained her to see them dying. When the troops had all mustered, up stood the great runner, Achilles, and said, Well, Agamemnon, it looks as if we'd better give up and sail home, assuming any of us are left alive, if we have to fight both the war and this plague. But why not consult with some prophet or priest or a dream interpreter, since dreams too come from Zeus, who could tell us why Apollo is so angry? If it's for a vow or a sacrifice he holds us at fault, maybe he'd be willing to lift this plague from us if he savored the smoke from lambs and prime goats. Achilles had his say and sat down, then uprode, uprose Calchas, son of Thestor, bird reader supreme, who knew what is, what will be, and what has been. He had guided the Greek ships to Troy through the prophetic power Apollo had given him, and he spoke out now. Achilles, beloved of Zeus, you want 
me to tell you about the rage of Lord Apollo, the Arch Destroyer, and I will tell you, but you have to promise me and swear you will support me and protect me in word and deed. I have a feeling I might offend a person of some authority among the Greeks, and you know how it is when a king is angry with an underling. He might swallow his temper for a day, but he holds it in his heart until later and it all comes out. Will you guarantee my security? Achilles, the great runner, responded, Don't worry, prophesy to the best of your knowledge. I swear by Apollo to whom you pray when you reveal the god's secrets of the Greeks, Calchas, that while I live and look upon this earth, no one will lay a hand on you here beside these hollow ships. No, not even Agamemnon, who boasts he is the best of the Achaeans. And Calchas, the perfect prophet, taking courage. The gods find no fault with vow or sacrifice. It is for his priests whom Agamemnon dishonored and would not allow to ransom his daughter that Apollo deals and will deal death from afar. He will not lift this foul plague from the Greeks until we return the dancing-eyed girl to her father, unransomed, unbought, and make formal sacrifice on Christ. Only then might we appease the gods. He finished speaking and sat down. <sighs> then uprose Atreus' son, the warlord Agamemnon. Furious, Anger like twin black thunderheads seething in his lungs, and his eyes flickered with fire as he looked Calchas up and down and said, You damn soothsayer! You've never given me a good omen yet! You take some kind of perverse pleasure in prophesying doom, don't you? Not a single favorable omen ever. Nothing good ever happens. And now you stand here uttering oracles before the Greeks, telling us that your great ballistic god is giving us all this trouble because I was unwilling to accept the ransom for Chryses' daughter, but preferred instead to keep her in my tent. And why shouldn't I? I like her better than my wife, Clytemnestra. She's no worse than her when it comes to looks, body, mind, or ability. Still, I'll give her back, if that's what's best. I don't want to see the army destroyed like this. But I want another prize ready for me right away. I'm not going to be the only Greek without a prize. It wouldn't be right. And you all see where mine is going. And Achilles... Strong, swift, and godlike. And where do you think, son of Atreus, you greedy glory hound, the magnanimous Greeks are going to get another prize for you? Do you think we have some kind of stockpile in reserve? Every town in the area has been sacked, and the stuff all divided. You want the men to count it all back and redistribute it? All right. You give the girl back to the god. The, the army will repay you three and four times over when and if Zeus allows us to rip Troy down to its foundations. The warlord Agamemnon responded, You may be a good man in a fight, Achilles, and look like a god, but don't try to put one over on me. It won't work. So while you have your prize... You want me to sit tight and do without? Give the girl back, just like that. Now maybe if the army in a generous spirit voted me some suitable prize of their own choice, something fair. But if it doesn't, I'll just go take something myself. Your prize, perhaps, or Ajax's, or Odysseus's. And whoever she belongs to, 
it'll stick in his throat. But we can think about that later. Right now, we launch a black ship on the bright salt water, get a crew on board, load on a hundred bulls, and have Chryseis board her too. My girl with her lovely cheeks. And we'll want a good man for captain, Ajax or Idominius or godlike Odysseus, or maybe you, son of Peleus, our most formidable hero, to offer sacrifice and appease the arch destroyer for us. Achilles looked him up and down and said, You shameless, profiteering excuse for a commander. How are you going to get any Greek warrior to follow you into battle again? You know, I don't have any quarrel with the Trojans. They didn't do anything to me to make me come over here and fight, didn't run off my cattle or horses, or ruin my farmland back in Thea. Not with all the shadowy mountains and moaning seas between. It's for you, dogface, for your precious pleasure and Menelaus' honor that we came here. A fact you don't have the decency even to mention, and now you're threatening to take away the prize that I sweated for and the Greeks gave me? I never get a prize equal to yours when the army captures one of the Stro Trojan strongholds. No, I do all the dirty work with my own hands, and when the battle's over and we divide the loot, you get the lion's share. And I go back to the ships with some pitiful thing, so worn out from fighting, I don't have the strength left even to complain. Well... I'm going back to Thea now. Far better to head home with my curved ships than stay here, unhonored myself and piling up a fortune for you. The warlord Agamemnon responded. Go ahead and desert if that's what you want. I'm not going to beg you to stay. There are plenty of others who will honor me, not least of all Zeus, the counselor. To me, you're the most hateful king under heaven, a born troublemaker. You actually like fighting and war. If you're all that strong, it's just a gift from some god. So why don't you go home with your ships and lord it over your precious myrmidons? I couldn't care less about you or your famous temper. <laughs> but I'll tell you this. Since Phoebus Apollo is taking away my Chryseis whom I'm sending back aboard ship with my friends, I'm coming to your hut and taking Briseis, your own beautiful prize, so that you will see just how much stronger I am than you, and the next person will wince at the thought of opposing me as an equal. Achilles' chest was a rough knot of pain twisting around his heart. Should he draw the sharp sword that hung by his thigh, scatter the ranks and gut Agamemnon, or control his temper, repress his rage? He was mulling it over, inching the great sword from its sheath, when out of the blue, Athena came, sent by the white-armed goddess Hera, who loved and watched over both men. She stood behind Achilles and grabbed his sandy hair, visible only to him. Not another soul saw her. Awestruck, Achilles turned around, recognizing Pallas Athena at once. It was her eyes. And words flew from his, from his mouth like winging birds. Daughter of Zeus, why have you come here? To see Agamemnon's arrogance, no doubt. I'll tell you where I place my bets, goddess. Sudden death for this outrageous behavior. Athena's eyes glared through the sea's salt haze. I came to see if I could check this temper of yours. Sent from heaven by the white-armed goddess. Hera, who loves and watches over both of you men. Now, come on, drop this quarrel. Don't draw your sword. Tell him off instead, and I'll tell you, Achilles, 
how things will be. You're going to get three times as many magnificent gifts because of his arrogance. Just listen to us and be patient. Achilles, the great runner, responded, When you two speak, goddess, a man has to listen, no matter how angry. It's better that way. Obey the gods, and they hear you when you pray. With that, he ground his heavy hand onto the silver hilt and pushed the great sword back into its sheath. Athena's speech had been well-timed. She was on her way to Olympus by now, to the halls of Zeus and the other immortals, while Achilles tore into Agamemnon again. You bloated drunk with a dog's eyes and a rabbit's heart. You've never had the guts to buckle on armor in battle or come out with the best fighting Greeks on any campaign. Afraid to look death in the eye, Agamemnon, it's far more profitable to hang back in the army's rear, isn't it? Confiscating prizes from any Greek who talks back and bleeding your people dry. There's not a real man under your command, or this latest atrocity would be your last son of Atreus. Now get this straight. I swear a formal oath by this scepter, which will never sprout leaf or branch again since it was cut from its stock in the mountains, which will bloom no more now that bronze has pared off leaf and bark, and which now the sons of the Greeks hold in their hands at council, upholding Zeus's laws. By this scepter, I swear, when every last Greek desperately misses Achilles, your remorse won't do any good then, when Hector the man-killer swats you down like flies. And you will eat your heart out, because you failed to honor the best Greek of all. Those were his words, and he slammed the scepter studded with gold to the ground and sat down. Opposite him, Agamemnon fumed. Then Nestor stood up. Sweet-worded Nestor, the orator from Pylos, with a voice high-toned and liquid as honey. He had seen two generations of men pass away in Sandy Pylos, and was now king in the third. He was full of goodwill in the speech he made. It's a sad day for Greece, a sad day. Priam and Priam's sons would be happy indeed, and the rest of the Trojans too, glad in their hearts, if they learned all this about you two fighting, our two best men in council and in battle. Now, you listen to me, both of you. <laughs> you are both younger than I am, and I've associated with men better than you and they didn't treat me lightly. I've never seen men like those and never will. The likes of Perithos and Dryas, a shepherd to his people, Canus and Exadius, and godlike Polyphemus, and Aegis's son, Theseus, who could have passed for a god, the strongest man who ever lived on earth, the strongest and they fought with the strongest, with wild things from the mountains, and beat the daylights out of them. <laughs> I was their companion, although I came from Pylos. From the ends of the earth, they sent for me themselves, and I held my own fighting with them. <laughs> you couldn't find a mortal man on earth who could fight with them now, and when I talked in council, they took my advice. You should 
so should you too now. Taking advice is a good thing. Agamemnon, for all your nobility, don't take his girl, leave her be. The army originally gave her to him as a prize. Nor should you, son of Peleus, want to lock horns with a king. A scepter-holding king has honor beyond the rest of men, power and glory given by Zeus himself. You are stronger, and it is a goddess who bore you. But he is more powerful, since he rules over more, son of Atreus. Cease your anger. And I appeal to Achilles to control his temper, since he is, for all Greeks, a mighty bulwark in this evil war. And Agamemnon the warlord. Yes, old man, everything you've said is absolutely right. But this man wants to be ahead of everyone else. He wants to rule over everyone, give orders to everyone, lord it over everyone, and he's not going to get away with it. If the gods eternal made him a spearman, does that mean they gave him permission to be insolent as well? And Achilles, breaking in on him, Ha! And think of the names people would call me if I bowed and scraped every time you opened your mouth. Try that on somebody else, but not on me. I'll tell you this, and you can stick it in your gut. I'm not going to put up a fight on account of the girl. You, all of you, gave her. And you can take her back. But anything else of mine in my black sailing ship, you keep your goddamn hands off, you hear? Try it. Let everybody see how fast your black blood boils up around my spear. So, it was a standoff. Their battle of words, and the assembly beside the Greek ships dissolved. Achilles went back to the huts by his ships, with Patroclus and his men. Agamemnon had a fast ship hauled down to the sea, picked twenty oarsmen, loaded on a hundred bulls due to the god, and had Chryseis' daughter, his fair-cheeked girl, go aboard also. Odysseus captained, and when they were all on board, the ship headed out to sea. On shore, Agamemnon ordered a purification. The troops scrubbed down and poured the filth into the sea. Then they sacrificed to Apollo, oxen and goats by the hundreds on the barren shore. The smoky savor swirled up to the sky. That was the order of the day. But Agamemnon did not forget his spiteful threat against Achilles. He summoned Talthybius and Eurybates, faithful retainers who served as his heralds. Go to the hut of Achilles, son of Peleus. Bring back the girl, fair-cheeked Briseis. If he won't give her up, I'll come myself with my men and take her and freeze his heart cold. It was not the sort of mission a herald would relish. The pair trailed along the barren seashore until they came to the Myrmidons' ships and encampment. They found Achilles sitting outside his hut beside his black ship. He was not glad to see them. They stood respectfully silent in awe of this king, and it was Achilles who was moved to address them first. <laughs> Welcome, heralds, the gods' messengers and men's. Come closer. You're not to blame. Agamemnon is, who sent you here for the girl Briseis. Patroclus, bring the girl out and give her to these gentlemen. You two are witnesses before the blessed gods, before mortal men 
and that hard-hearted king, if ever I'm needed to protect the others from being hacked to bits. His mind is murky with anger, and he doesn't have the sense to look ahead and behind to see how the Greeks might defend their ships. Thus Achilles. Patroclus obeyed his beloved friend, and brought Briseis, cheeks flushed, out of the tent, and gave her to the heralds, who led her away. She went unwillingly. Then Achilles in tears withdrew from his friends and sat down far away on the foaming white seashore, staring out at the endless sea, stretching out his hands. He prayed over and over to his beloved mother. Mother, since you bore me for a short life only, Olympian Zeus was supposed to grant me honor. Well, he hasn't given me any at all. Agamemnon has taken away my prize and dishonored me. His voice choked with tears was heard by his mother as she sat in the sea depths beside her old father. She rose up from the white-capped sea like a mist, and settling herself beside her weeping child, she stroked him with her hand and talked to him. Why are you crying, son? What's wrong? Don't keep it inside. Tell me so we'll both know. And Achilles, with a deep groan, You already know. Why do I have to tell you? We went after Thebes, Asian sacred town, sacked it, and brought the plunder back here. The army divided everything up and chose for Agamemnon fair-cheeked Chryseis. Then her father, Chryses, a priest of Apollo, came to our army's ships on the beachhead, hauling a fortune for his daughter's ransom. He displayed Apollo's sacral ribbons on a golden staff and made a formal plea to the entire Greek army, but especially the commander Atreus' two sons. <gasps> You could hear the troops murmuring, respect the priest and take the ransom, but Agamemnon wouldn't hear of it, and dismissed Chryses with a rough speech. The old man went back angry, and Apollo heard his beloved priest's prayer. He hit the Greeks hard, and the troops were falling over dead, the gods' arrows raining down all through the Greek camp. A prophet told the arch-destroyer's will, and I demanded the god be appeased. Agamemnon got angry, stood up, and threatened me, and made good his threat. The high command sent the girl on a fast ship back to Christ with gifts for Apollo, and heralds led my girl away, Briseis, whom the army had given to me. Now you have to help me, if you can. Go to Olympus and, tell, and call in the debt that Zeus owes you. I remember often hearing you tell in my father's house how you alone managed of all the immortals to save Zeus's neck when the other Olympians wanted to bind him, Hera and Poseidon and Pallas Athena. You came and loosened him from his chains, and you lured to Olympus's summit the giant with a hundred hands whom the gods call Brarius. But men call Agion, stronger even than his own father Uranus, and he sat hulking in front of the cloud-black Zeus, proud of his prowess and scared all the gods who were trying to put the son of Kronos in chains. Remind Zeus of this. Sit, holding his knees, see if he is willing to help the Trojans hem the Greeks in between the fleet of the sea. Once they start being killed, the Greeks may appreciate Agamemnon for what he is. And the wide ruling son of Atreus will see what a fool he's been because he did not honor the best Greek, the best of all the fighting Achaeans. And Thetis, now weeping herself. Oh, my poor child, I bear you for sorrow, nursed you for grief. Why, you should be spending your time here by your ships, happily and untroubled by tears, since life is short for you, all too brief. Now, you're destined for both an early death and misery beyond compare. 
It was for this I gave birth to you in your father's palace under an evil star. I'll go to snowbound Olympus and tell all this to the Lord of Lightning. I hope he listens. You stay here, though, beside your ships, and let the Greeks feel your spite. Withdraw completely from the war. Zeus left yesterday for the river ocean on his way to a feast with the Ethiopians. All the gods went with him. He'll return to Olympus twelve days from now, and I'll go then to his bronze threshold and plead with him. I think I'll persuade him. And she left him there, angry and heartsick at being forced to give up the silken wasted girl. Meanwhile, Odysseus was putting in at Christ with his sacred cargo on board. When they were well within the deep water harbor, they furled the sail and stowed it in the ship's hold, slackened the forestays and lowered the mast. Working quickly, then rowed her to a mooring where they dropped anchor and made the stern cables fast. The crew disembarked on the sea beach and unloaded the bulls for Apollo the archer. Then Chryses' daughter stepped off the seagoing vessel, and Odysseus led her to an altar and placed her in her father's hands, saying, Chryses, King Agamemnon has sent me here to return your child and to offer Phoebus formal sacrifice on behalf of the Greeks. So may we appease Lord Apollo, and may he lift the afflictions he has sent upon us. Chryses received his daughter tenderly. Moving quickly, they lined the hundred oxen round the massive altar, a glorious offering, washed their hands, sprinkled on the victim's sacrificial barley. On behalf of the Greeks, Chryses lifted his hands and prayed aloud, Hear me, silver bow, protector of Christ, Lord of Holy Scylla, master of Tenedos, as once before you heard my prayer, did me honor, and smote the Greeks mightily. So now also grant me this prayer. Lift the plague from the Greeks and save them from death. Thus the old priest and Apollo heard him. After the prayers and the strewing of barley, they slaughtered and flayed the oxen, jointed the thigh bones and wrapped them in a layer of fat with cuts of meat on top. The old man roasted them over charcoal and doused them with wine. Younger men stood by with five tined forks in their hands. When the thigh pieces were charred and they had tasted the tripe, they cut the rest into strips, skewed it on spits and roasted it skillfully. When they were done and the feast was ready, feast they did, and no one lacked an equal share. When they had all had enough to eat and drink, the young men topped off mixing bowls with wine and served it in goblets to all the guests. All day long these young Greeks propitiated the gods with dancing, singing to Apollo, Apian as they danced, and the god was pleased. When the sun went down and the darkness came on, they went to sleep by the ship's stern cables. Dawn came early, a palmetto of rose. Time to make sail for the wide beachhead camp. They set up mast and spread the white canvas, and the following wind sent by Apollo boomed in the mainsail. An indigo wave hissed off the bow as the ship surged on, leaving a wake as she held on course through the billows. When they reached the beachhead camp, they hauled the black ship high on the sand and jammed in the long chocks. Then the crew scattered to their own huts and ships.
All this time, Achilles, the son of Peleus, in the line of Zeus, nursed his anger. The great runner, idle by his fleet's fast holes, he was not to be seen in council, that arena for glory, nor in combat. He sat tight in camp, consumed with grief, his great heart yearning for the battle cry and war. Twelve days went by. Dawn. The gods returned to Olympus. Zeus at their head. Thetis did not forget her son's requests. She rose from the sea and up through the air to the great sky and found Kronos' wide-seeing sun sitting in isolation on the highest peak of the rugged Olympic massif. She settled beside him and touched his knees with her left hand and his beard with her right and made her plea to the lord of the sky. Father Zeus, if I have ever helped you in word or deed among the immortals, grant me this prayer. Honor my son, doomed to die young and yet dishonored by King Agamemnon, who stole his prize, a personal affront. Do justice by him, Lord of Olympus. Give the Trojans the upper hand until the Greeks grant my son the honor he deserves. Zeus made no reply, but sat a long time in silence, clouds scuttling around him. Thetis held fast to his knees and asked again, Give me a clear yes or no, either nod in assent or refuse me. Why should you care if I know how negligible a goddess I am in your eyes? This provoked a troubled, gloomy response. This is disastrous. You're going to force me into conflict with Hera. I can just hear her now, cursing me and bawling me out. As it is, she already accuses me of favoring the Trojans. Please go back the way you came. Maybe Hera won't notice. I'll take care of this. And so you can have some peace of mind. I'll say yes to you by nodding my head. The ultimate pledge, unambiguous, irreversible, and absolutely fulfilled whatever I say yes to with a nod of my head. And the son of Kronos nodded, black brows lowered, a glory of hair cascading down from the Lord's immortal head, and the holy mountain trembled. Their conference over, the two parted. The goddess dove into the deep sea from Olympus's snow glare, and Zeus went to his home. The gods all rose from their seats at their father's entrance. Not one dared watch him enter without standing to greet him. And so the god entered and took his high seat. But Hera had noticed his private conversation with Thetis, the silver-footed daughter of the old man of the sea, and flew at him with cutting words. Who is that you were scheming with just now? You just love devising secret plots behind my back, don't you? You can't bear to tell me what you're thinking, or you don't dare, never have, and never will. The father of the gods and men answered, Hera, don't hope to know all my secret thoughts. It would strain your mind, even though you are my wife. What it is proper to hear, no one, human or divine, will hear before you. But what I wish to conceive apart from the other gods, don't pry into that. And Lady Hera, with her oxen eyes wide, Oh my, the awesome son of Kronos has spoken. Pry, you know that I never pry, and you always cheerfully volunteer whatever information you please. It's just 
that I have this feeling that somehow the silver-footed daughter of the old man of the sea may have won you over. She was sitting beside you up there in the mists, and she did touch your knees. And I'm pretty sure that you agreed to honor Achilles and destroy Greeks by the thousands beside their ships? And Zeus, the master of cloud and storm. You witch! Your intuitions are always right. But what does it get you? Nothing. Except that I like you less than ever. And so you're worse off. If it's as, if it's as you think it is, it's my business, not yours. So sit down and shut up and do as I say. You see these hands? All the gods on Olympus won't be able to help you if I ever lay them on you. Hera lost her nerve when she heard this. She sat down in silence, fear cramping her heart, and gloom settled over the gods in Zeus's hall. Hephaestus, the master artisan, broke the silence out of concern for his ivory-armed mother. This is terrible. It's going to ruin us all. If you two quarrel like this over mortals, it's bound to affect us gods. There'll be no more pleasure in our feasts if we let things turn ugly. Mother, please, I don't have to tell you, you have to be pleasant to our father's use so he won't get so he won't be angry and ruin our feast if the lord of lightning wants to blast us from our seats he can that's how much stronger he is so apologize to him with silken soft words and the olympian in turn will be gracious to us he whisked up a two-handled cup and offered it to his dear mother and said to her, I know it's hard, mother, but you have to endure it. I don't want to see you getting beat up and me unable to help you. The Olympian can be rough. <laughs> Once before... When I tried to rescue you, he flipped me by my foot off our balcony. <laughs> I fell all day and came down when the sun did on the island of Lemna, scarcely alive. The sentients had to nurse me back to hell. <laughs> by the time he finished, the ivory-armed goddess was smiling at her son. She accepted the cup from him. Then... The lame god turned a serving boy, siphoning nectar from the mixing bowl and pouring sweet liquor for all the gods who couldn't stop laughing at the sight of Hephaestus hustling through the halls. And so all day long, until the sun went down, they feasted to their heart's content, Apollo playing beautiful melodies on the lyre the muses singing responsively in lovely voices. And when the last gleams of sunset had faded, they turned in for the night, each to a house built by Hephaestus, the renowned master craftsman, the burly blacksmith with the soul of an artist. And the Lord of Lightning, Olympian Zeus, went to his bed, the bed he always slept in. When sweet sleep overcame him, he climbed in and slept next to golden-throned Hera. And that, my friends, is the end of book one of Iliad. Woo! We got through book one. Well done. Thank you for joining me for this. Um, 
a few thoughts before I actually... That's it for the reading tonight, but a few thoughts about all this. And a couple things. Hephaestus mentions this in this story he just told. And it's mentioned of him hustling through the halls. Hephaestus is a cripple. Uh, or he has a very bad limp. He's somewhat deformed. He's known as a very ugly god, actually. Because of Zeus, you know, flipping him. And, uh... It's interesting that the other gods laugh at him when they see it. They're very cruel about it, I think, by today's standards. But it's also like, he built all their houses. And he's the one who saves dinner. <laughs> you know. Um, it's also kind of interesting to see Zeus threatening Hera. In fact, their relationship is what I might politely refer to him, refer to as extremely complicated. You see, Zeus is known to be the most unfaithful thing in anything ever. If it moves, or if it doesn't, sometimes he's gonna sleep with it. Um, and there's all kinds of stories about that, <laughs> some of which are weirdly relevant to this one. In fact, the only thing that we know Zeus will not sleep with, sleep with is Thetis. And the reason why is because if he has a son with her, then that son is prophesied to kill him. So when she's, like, touching his leg and beard and stuff, like, she knows this stuff and uh, is putting the pressure on him a little, in a weird way there. I think it's interesting also that Chryses is Apollo's priest because Apollo is Artemis's brother. Um, they're both son and daughter of Leto. And um, if you remember what I said at the beginning before we started reading is that Agamemnon sacrificed his daughter to Artemis. And now there's another man coming who serves the brother of Artemis, an interesting parallel there, who ends up asking for his daughter back. And Agamemnon says no. And then, uh, and then Agamemnon is punished for it. So it's a little interesting how, you know, Agamemnon tries to he, he doesn't have a whole lot of empathy, you know, with like what it's like to lose a daughter cuz there's every indication we have Agamemnon is not a guy who was um happy to kill his daughter. You know, that's one of the things. It's like that was a big moment for him as like he's changed after that. And it wasn't easy, and his wife was not okay. This wasn't a time where people were just fine with letting their kids die, all right? I don't want you to get that impression, because we don't get that impression from all the surviving literature about that story. Um, so I just think that's an interesting parallel. Another weird thing is that the Greeks have a religious ceremony with crises. And it's like, these guys are kind of on the Trojan side, right? Like, they're allies. They're in that land. It's like, but these guys are sharing a service. It's like, in a weird way, it's almost like in World War One when the Germans and, uh, I think it was the Brits or the French. Oh, my goodness. I can't believe I don't. It's the Brits. Uh, whatever. Someone. Huh. What an embarrassing moment to have live. I don't remember who it was. But the Christmas Armistice, when they sang Silent Night the night before, and then the next day. They come, can you imagine stopping a war with an enemy to have a church service with them that would be odd i think and i think it just shows that like this there's, there's something odd about this war and these people they have a lot in common it's not like oh well we don't serve the same gods we're not going to partake in this ceremony it's like they they both are on the same page they know what needs to be done also the um I just wanted to talk about the sacrifice as well with the hundred oxen. That's that's a lot. I don't think I'd be able to get that today. Um, but the thing that's so interesting about that is that's how they would do sacrifices back then. Um, the Greeks were interesting because their sacrifices, they would not sacrifice the meat. You notice they eat the meat. The sacrifice is also a feast. It's like, well, what are you giving to the god if you're getting to eat it? Well, there's actually a story about that where Prometheus, who was a titan, tricked Zeus because Prometheus made man, and the gods expected sacrifices, and so Prometheus was able to trick Zeus with two altars by having one altar covered in meat, and then that meat was covered with the intestines and guts, and then the other altar was just bones and glistening fat. 
and he offered both to Zeus, and Zeus saw the intestines, and then he saw the glistening fat, and he's like, oh, I'm going to go with that. And then he pulls it apart and realizes it's just bones. But the decision had been made, and so from that point on, the Greeks always just sacrificed bones and fat and kept the meat for themselves. So their ceremonies, their sacrifices that uh, they got to eat, they were, they were feasts, you know, which is kind of cool. That's something we see in a lot of different cultures is that there's this sort of spiritual thing that goes to um eating you know christians with you know the communion and all that it's like uh there's so it's really interesting how that happens uh to me i think it's interesting you know it's like I, sometimes you might it's like the snickers commercials or it's like you're not yourself when you're hungry there's something weird about like when you eat with someone it's really hard to hurt them or kill them you know, like a family that eats together stays together, you know, allegedly. But the, um, <laughs> ooh, that was dark. Um, there's, uh, yeah, so, um, uh, but, uh, yeah, the first word of this whole poem is rage. And I, I'm not going to get into the Greek a whole lot because I don't know Greek yet. Maybe I'll learn it for this series. <laughs> I don't know. But the first word is rage. And in Greek, I do know this, that's menin, all right, which is like menace. All right, M E N I S, and it's spelled M E N I E N for like the conjunction, or I don't know, I don't know that part. But menin doesn't just mean normal anger. Menin is like a divine rage. It's a word that's only used when describing the anger of the gods. Um, you know, and through the rest of this whole Iliad, like anytime it's uh, it, whenever Homer was like menin, he was always talking about the gods. Or Achilles. All right, and that should kind of tell you a bit more about this. Also, it's a little weird. Let's talk about how how weird this situation is. I think it's interesting that Briseis left unwillingly. Maybe some we might call it Stockholm syndrome today. Maybe back then they would call it falling in love. I don't. I don't know. Um, but uh, it's interesting that I think there is an intentional parallel between Artemis and Apollo here because they mention. Apollo's parents, Leto and Zeus, like both uh, throughout this thing, I've been making notes on it, and I just think that's a really interesting parallel that like Crises is with Apollo and is getting his daughter back, and then Agamemnon with Artemis was not, and it's like uh, it's it's a little things are fickle there. Um, also, talk about egos going around, you know, it's like Agamemnon, I'm the best, Achilles, I'm the best. And then, um, you know, he's a total mama's boy as well. Uh, there's no fault in that, you know, <laughs> but he is. And um, I think it's interesting also when he's telling his mom what happened. A lot of people would see this, I think, as just a repeat of what we saw before. In fact, a lot of it is word for word. Like when it says, um, when it says, like, respect the priest and take the ransom, when he's telling his mom, like, everything that happened, almost all of his verbatim from the beginning of the poem, except for one part, which I think is very interesting and telling, um, because he says, I demanded that God be appeased. Agamemnon got angry. <laughs> like, he wasn't calling him a pig ear, dog faced, drunken, whatever he said. You know, there's a lot of great insults in Iliad, a lot of great monologues. Nestor being very political, like, hey, you're noble, hey, you're strong, you know, let's let's work it out. The bad guys wouldn't would want this, you know, let's put it together, but they just can't hold back and listen they're even they even admit like, Nestor, you're right, but that guy's a jerk and they can't handle it. Um and that's why Nestor is perhaps known as the wiser one. And uh, Achilles and Agamemnon are not known as the smart ones. Odysseus is the smart guy. Um, but yeah, Achilles totally leaves out the name calling. And uh, yeah, so there's more stuff here because one of the things that's weird is most of the gods are related to each other. It's like they are a family. There's some exceptions to that, kind of. Um, and we'll get more into that later, I think, because this has been a good episode. I'm really... Um, pleased with how this went i hope you enjoyed my reading i hope i wasn't too loud or too soft on the mic you know it's just gonna have to be the way it is also i might be bringing a drum in at some point to keep rhythm but at the moment i have to hold the book with one hand and it's kind of you know hard to get that around so i think there's there's a part in book two that i want to bring it in and you'll see why 
I think. Um, but with that, um, I think, you know, we've had a, enough for tonight. Uh, I could keep going. I couldn't wait for tonight from Monday. On Wednesday, I was like, ah, oh, it's tonight. And I was like, oh, no, I gave myself an extra day, and I was just restless. So I hope that you've enjoyed this with me. New episodes happen every uh, Monday and Thursday evening, Eastern Daylight Time at 7.30. And, oh, there's one more thing. I have a special announcement. I meant to say at the beginning, if you stay till the end, there'll be a special announcement. Um, a very good personal friend of mine, uh, Benjamin T. Wilson, is hosting his own live stream tomorrow evening at 7.30 Eastern Daylight Time. And there's actually a link to uh, his channel in the description of this video. Now, the thing that's cool about that is uh, the reason why I'm even bringing it up, aside from just, you know, he's my friend and I like, you know, that there's, um, he's, you know, in this time of pandemic, which is one of the reasons why we're doing this whole thing is so that we have something to do while we're being subjugated to all this free time, is uh, he's brought a lot of artists together, musical artists, and they're going to be uh, playing, they, they've made an album that they each he'll explain it all but basically there's an album release tomorrow and you can get the link to his channel in the description of this video i hope you check that out if you want some cool music that is pandemic themed from what i understand and in fact one of the tracks on that album is being done by my nah, being done by my dear older brother uh so i'm very excited to hear that uh, i'm not personally really involved with the album um i just am excited about it. I hope that you are too. And with that, um, I'm going to look at the comments here. Thank you for being involved in the chat. Now, last time the chat was also, I couldn't go see it afterward. I don't know what was up, so I'm actually going to take time to go through this right now. And um, the video later will have like the timer at the beginning cut off, and maybe we'll cut out this part. Uh, but let's see what we got here. Oh yeah, I said before people are interested in the, you know, some are some are rooting for the Trojans, which is pretty cool. Um, the Guildenstern are dead version of Greek myths, where is a bunch of eagles and offer sign animals just screwing with the soothsayers. <laughs> I like that. Okay. Um, all right. Oh, yeah, so I can see uh, at least one person said, you see, you guys want to side with this Agamemnon Trojans all the way. I think they probably said that either when I mentioned that Agamemnon sacrificed his eldest daughter or when he took Briseis away and was being a jerk to Achilles and all that. Um, <laughs> here we go, Trojans. Here we go. <laughs> um, team Hector, hashtag Team Hector. Yeah, okay should draw up on a mutiny with this special ops team oh yeah uh patroclus achilles's beloved friend in quotes beloved yeah don't worry i'll talk about that later everything in its time guys and uh, <laughs> zeus having a complicated marriage no not possible um <laughs> you want to talk about stuff and and the best comment from this evening is from Benji the Koi Boy. You want to talk stuff in common? Paris and Menelaus even have the same wife. And I just think that's a perfect note to end on this evening. With that, thank you for joining me. And uh, if you are watching this after the fact, as in not live, I'm really happy and impressed and excited and pleased and honored and humbled, etc., that you made it this far. This is not a short series. I don't really leave stuff out, uh, and that's kind of the point. Is I've learned, I love this book. I've learned about Iliad my whole life, and there's all kinds of different resources around, and they're great resources. But on YouTube, I found that a lot of I couldn't find a single resource that was really focused on Iliad, where like all that stuff came together, you know. And um, so that's kind of what I'm trying to do. Is like this is the if you want to learn about Iliad, hopefully this is the channel for you. Anyway, um, that's it. I'm just stalling now, so have a wonderful evening. And I'll see you Monday evening. And actually, hopefully see you tomorrow. Remember, don't forget, link in the description to Ben's live stream. Cheerio.